The other thing is things like Dodd-Frank, which have raised the compliance cost for a lot of the big firms. Now, if you ask big firms, do you want more compliance costs? They say, oh no, please don't throw me in that briar patch. In fact, it is they might have written this law themselves. And in fact, Barney Frank was the largest recipient of Wall Street campaign funds of anyone in the House of Representatives. Now, because the, you're, rise, you're raising rivals' costs, is what he's saying. It, it, it makes it makes entry impossible. Hello, welcome to Nix. Finding nuanced discussions on controversial topics is difficult. We're building a technology platform to fix that. Join our waitlist to be part of the solution. In this debate, we have Professor Michael Munger and Professor Richard Epstein discussing the reforms they would like to see to encourage growth in the U.S. economy. You can find their bios and relevant links in the show notes. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter at the underscore Nix. Enjoy the debate and tell us at the link below what you'd like to see next. Well, the way in which I'm going to frame this discussion, and I think it sort of uh, fits, is we're trying to figure out what are going to be the causes and the causes of American growth and the causes of the grind decline in American growth. Um, this is a kind of an economic-oriented program where, in general, we think that if the total level of production is higher, problems of distribution will be less acute because a rising tide will raise all, will raise all ships. And then the question is, we have two kinds of factors. There are those that are affecting individual industries, and we also have those which affect all industries as a group. And I'm going to start with the latter situation, because I think the common elements that we see today are a systematic depressant of everything that has gone on. Now, some, time ago, some time ago, there's a book written by Robert Gordon called The Rise and Decline of American Growth. And essentially, I think the explanation for the decline comes in one word, too much regulation. Three words, if it were. Uh, what happens is the function of regulation, from my view, has always been to facilitate voluntary transactions that increase the size of the pie. And huge numbers of institutions of common law help you achieve that end. Simple writing requirements and recordation requirements, which solidify the security of transactions and prevent double dealing, are the kind of things that we need. But in general, what's happened today is people see all sorts of market perfections of one kind or another, and then say that they have to correct them some, some form of regulation. So take a market which should be competitive, which is economic employment markets, and what we systematically see is everybody saying that they're markets of exploitation. So we need minimum wage laws, maximum hours laws, anti-discrimination laws, and this stuff. And each of these things in its own way across all industries imposes impediments upon growth, and that one has to make sure that you could remove them. On the other side, uh, if you want small companies, they have to become large companies. And in order to be able to do that, you have to have a seam of capital formation. And what that has to do is to allow people to start in their backyard, uh, max out on their credit cards, talk to their family and friends, slowly get outside badges, and then eventually go forward, and take the cash out of the particular system, and then reinvest it separately in other new ventures. Uh, we have a securities law, which makes it very difficult to do today. And instead of having companies go public, uh, it is often that small companies are acquired by big companies. And the usual consequence of that is a kind of sclerosis starts to set in because independent entrepreneurs do better under uncertainty than people who are constantly watched by somebody else. And so the whole flow of capital into security markets, I think, has been effectively diminished. You start looking at lending policies, they're not based upon the profitability of the loan. There are too many DEI constraints of one sort or another, which again is going to inhibit the allocation of capital by large firms and public markets, and to some extent by private firms as well. And so at the macroeconomic level, what's happened is a kind of a systematic denigration of people as ignorant and uninformed as Milton Friedman and a celebration of people who are as learned as Joe Biden. And you cannot survive in an economy if what you do is you put all your stuff in the same direction. And so as a global matter, the securities market seemed to be messed up. The FTC headed by Linda Kahn has no idea of what's going on in 
in those regulatory markets, uh, SEC, uh, every, the environmental protection agencies, every major agency in the United States turns out to be anti-growth and usually in the pursuit of something which cannot bear scrutiny. And so what we have to do is again, go back to the classical liberal presumption against regulation, which are designed to inhibit market transaction. And if we do that, then we can handle, I think, the sectoral differences. So my diagnosis of the large situation is that we've made a fatal bargain with all sorts of individuals who know what's better for us than we know for ourselves. And we seem to think that progressive bureaucrats are better able to run the economy than individual businesses are able to do it themselves. So that would be my global diagnosis. Michael, do you disagree? I well, I not. don't. I, I, not only do I not disagree, I mean, as usual, Richard is taking the Phil Spector wall of sound approach. Let me give the more acoustic unplugged version. But um, I, I just want to break that down for a second. Growth happens in three spheres, and the regulatory problems with those three spheres are different. So growth takes place at the level of the firm, the industry, and the economy. And there's different regulatory problems that, although the overall problem of regulation is quite right, there's different regulatory problems in each of those. So where what is it that growth comes from? And to start out, we need to recognize that exchange produces an increase in value with no increase in the amount of stuff because every agreement on price reflects a disagreement on value which is i think we don't say enough about economists look at prices and say oh look there's equilibrium prices in every case that means there's a disagreement about value the seller values it less than the price and the buyer values it more than the price any public policy that increases the amount of voluntary exchange is going to increase from a very decentralized perspective all of these exchanges so richard is gesturing you're absolutely right i mean this is i i don't want this to be able to say let me mention something there are two kinds of externalities in the world uh, the one that the legal system works best with is trying to control negative externalities, pollution and things like that, where if you don't control them, the total level of output will go down. But something that's always forgotten is that positive externalities exist from ordinary changes in exchange. And so when Michael starts talking about a game between me and he for the sale and promotion of a goods, uh, what about the external effects? Well, if we're engaging in voluntary exchanges, it turns out he has more stuff and I have more stuff. We'll use some of its consumption, which means we'll buy production from other people. And we'll use some of what we get in order to create further stuff on the chain of production. So the externalities are positive for voluntary exchange in the normal case, which is why it is it pays for the studies to subsidize these exchanges in the form of giving legal protection. Now, there are some exchanges that are negative. Michael and I are also nefarious guys, and we happen to control all the copper in the United States, and we agree to divide territories at a set prices. Now, those exchanges are negative. And so what we do is we refuse to enforce them and then answer the very difficult question, what about the antitrust stuff? The difficulty you get in the modern economy with people like Lena Khan is she doesn't know a positive exchange from a negative exchange. And so what she wants to do is to shut down some of the most sensible practices of a company like um, Amazon, thinking that they're either protect, predatory or exclusive or something else, but she doesn't understand how they work. And so they have, for example, a system which they will not give a firm a check of approval in the cart if it turns out there are lower prices elsewhere. She thinks that's anti-competitive. I think it's brilliantly competitive because the moment you put the chart on there, you're telling all your customers, you don't have to look anywhere else. If you stay here, you're as better as anywhere else. So it's a warranty and a warranty that brings confidence. So why you want to declare that as a per se illegal practice, what she's got is the wrong sign on a practice because she doesn't understand how markets work. And, and so what I listen to what Michael says, I, I think that the story that we want to stress is good contracts are recursive. You get larger outputs and then larger outputs and larger outputs again. And all the regulations that I'm talking about are designed to secure the elaborate chain of production that is necessary for these economic events to take place. But but you're you're you're, you're skipping way ahead. It, it, oh, I always do. Let, 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 let us start by establishing that exchange is good and produces positive externalities in a decentralized way that's very difficult to model, but that's the rising tide that lifts all ships. It really is an enormous benefit. Stuff is in the wrong place. 
exchange moves it towards higher valued uses in ways that is impossible to measure, a gigantic improvement in welfare. But the second thing that is a dynamic cause of growth is, and it's so obvious it's almost not worth saying, but everyone misses it, it's division of labor. Growth comes from division of labor. Increase in value comes from exchange. But then you just have the same amount of stuff. To get an increase in the amount of stuff, you need division of labor. And I want to echo something Richard said before. There are all these firms, all these small units that are trying to think of new ways to elaborate specialization and division of labor. I figured out a new way to do things, something new to produce, a cheaper way to produce it. If I am allowed to do that, and by allowed, I mean lack of regulatory barriers and the presence of the third thing that's important, which is liquidity, financial markets that are able to respond quickly and direct a fire hose of so far unformed assets to pursue profit opportunity. So the three things that I, I want to summarize Richard's wall of sound, exchange produces positive externalities. Division of labor produces growth because it's increasing returns. Liquidity is the key to making that system run. We have a set of regulations that are denying people the opportunity to engage in all three of those activities. And that means that we're seeing growth decline at the level of the firm, the level of the industry, and the level of the economy. So I, I just wanted to elaborate the parts because Richard always skips ahead. This is a it's really important argument to get those fundamentals, exchange, division of labor, and liquidity. Those are the keys to growth. Now, what are the keys to regulation, right? Well, what we do is we put all sorts of limits on the kinds of exchanges that could take place. And we always posit that there's some external benefit that we can't identify. Then when we get to the division of labor, uh, what you do is you have a very strong union movement in the United States. And one of the things that a movement of union does is limits management prerogatives of whether to buy or to make. Uh, so there's a case called Fiber Board from about 60 years ago. It's an unfair labor practice if you have a union to try to decentralize things by buying from an independent contractor that is more efficient than you are. And what happens, therefore, is your efficiency gains are limited to the firm subject to labor regulation rather than being put out. And there's nothing whatsoever that says a firm which specializes in X should be doing Y when it could buy something by a firm that specializes in Y uh, through the market of exchange. And the labor limitations on this, I, I like the exaggerated sense of Michael, they're simply enormous in terms of the way we go. Then you start getting to capital markets and all the rest of that stuff. And when you start seeing, well, we have to have certain limitations on the kinds of boards that we do at high compliance. And so I would just make the following observation about the decline of American productivity. What you want on a board of people essentially have visions about what new projects should be undertaken so that management can essentially get some kind of direction. What you get now, given the SEC and a whole variety of its situations, is you must have a compliance board which says you don't want to get into trouble and cost the firm because of regulatory penalties. As you shift the firm from offensive to defensive posture, what you do is you kill the engines that are associated with growth. And then you're trying to figure out exactly what kinds of enormous harms that you're trying to protect against in the overall economy. And I think it can be said perfectly clearly, the traditional rules of securities regulation were designed to protect against this kind of fraud. I'm telling you, I got a franchise to run a business raising money, but you don't have a franchise to run the business, it's a fraud. But now, in effect, what we're worried about is, well, you haven't told them enough about potentials of global warming associated with entering to certain partnerships with a certain other firm. And these might cost the economy 0.0001% degree of temperature change 50 years from now. And what we do is we demand disclosure and regulation on the wrong things, which means that the compliance boards become all the stronger. And you keep it down. And as Michael says, this is not us talking about small little details. My business is small little details as a lawyer, uh, but as an analyst, it's big stuff you want to do. And the answer is get the lower hanging fruit right. And we could, as we go further and further up the decision chain and the choices get harder and harder, it, the, the situations become much less frequent and the outcomes are much less. If a thing is closely balanced and occurs one in a million times, I'm not going to spend my life obsessing whether you've got it wrong. The thing for this kind of a show is to get the fundamentals right. And Michael and I, from very different positions, 
and with slightly different versions of the thing, essentially agree on the same kinds of imperatives at all three levels of the system. So the, let me emphasize one thing that was said. I, my, I'm, I'm an alumnus of the Federal Trade Commission myself. So I, I worked at the Federal Trade Commission right after the famous Michael Perchuk years. Yeah, and the, the, when, when I was there in the early and mid 80s, the unquiet ghost of Michael Perchuk was still walking the halls about you know, the necessity for this intrusive kind of, and Michael Perchuk was cast out to the lower regions, but what remained was the transformation of the Federal Trade Commission and to some extent the Justice Department from being law enforcement agencies to being regulatory agencies. And when the when the change in antitrust went from being a law enforcement agency with relatively predictable standards to being a basically a building inspector. Think what happens if you're a, if you're a building inspector in San Francisco. You're trying to build new condos and then you contact the building inspector. Will I be able to sell these condos? I don't know until the building inspector comes and looks at it. Maybe there'll be problems, maybe there won't. I can't borrow against this because it has no value. The Federal Trade Commission has gone from law enforcement of a clear set of standards to being like a building inspector was, we'll tell you if it's illegal after we look at it. And so there are many situations where I'm trying to negotiate, I'm a small nimble firm, I'm trying to negotiate some kind of new contract, which may or may not be per se illegal. I'm trying to, I'm trying to buy another company. And it, it may turn out that upon inspection, I'm not allowed to do this. So the fact that I can't tell what the law is, is a much bigger problem than the people at the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department, I think, the, the transformation of antitrust from being law enforcement to being a building inspector, well, well, we'll tell you after the fact whether this is acceptable. I don't think people realize what an enormous difference that is and how damaging it is to the sort of nimble changes in the economy. The other thing is things like Dodd-Frank, which have raised the compliance cost for a lot of the big firms. Now, if you ask big firms, do you want more compliance costs? They say, oh no, please don't throw me in that briar patch. In fact, it is they might have written this law themselves. And in fact, Barney Frank was the largest recipient of Wall Street campaign funds of anyone in the House of Representatives. Now, because the, you're, rise, you're raising rivals' costs, is what he's saying. It, 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 makes, it makes entry impossible. The, the, it would be illegal if they were to conspire and have contracts in restraint of trade but if the government does them does it for them that's fantastic and so that's what we've done yes i mean well lena khan is exactly like that there's a couple of explanations for this one is the fact that it used to be that regulators had some business experience and so they understood the way things worked on the other side and they understand that ex ante clearance is much more important than ex post validation because the interim uncertainty kills the deal that is taking place. Somebody but Lena Khan wrote this ridiculously incompetent article in the Yale Law Journal as a student in which she celebrated all forms of regulation that took place during the 1930s and so forth. Kind of believe that static protection of infant firms, a large firm in the market, was much more important than the disruptive forms that associated with respect to innovation. And then she gets pumped up and she's put on uh, the head of the FTC. Uh, you do not want people that young, that experienced, and that uneducated to take these kinds of positions. And it's not that the enforcement action has to be taken in many cases. If you read the rhetoric of both her and Jonathan Cantor, one of the things that they're proud of saying, it, we've killed so many deals to begin with because we know they're all bad. And what is it? You're basically saying that the ability for you to prevent deals from taking place means that you prevented abusive practices as opposed to innovation. And they're attaching the wrong side to their side to their achievement. They think it's a and it's a terrible thing in the way in which they operate. So we're in this odd situation where Michael and I keep goading each other into higher levels of indignation because the situation has become literally preposterous. Now, some of the banks are starting to back off of this a little bit because they realize what is trying to happen. Uh, but the forces of 
reaction or so entrenched in the way in which the economy has worked are that so long as this administration is in office, it's not just the president who's an economic illiterate, but every major agency, as far as I can tell, is headed by somebody who does not understand the fundamentals of his or her own industry. Well, Thane, did you want to, you had some questions that you were going yeah, to, sure. I don't know if this is going in the direction, because I, I, I have a follow-up to that, but if, if you have a question that you want to direct, that would be fine. Well, no, I, I think this is all like great background information. So if you want to follow up, uh, that would be just fine. And then maybe following that, we can kind of start thinking about what do we do to change this? Because I think that's going to be, that's becoming part of what a lot of people are thinking about. And obviously there's intense inertia, but um, I think you wrote that paper uh, the other day um, about the directionalists versus uh, I forget what the the other name that you had, but yes, it was about, yes, correct. So it's about taking you know piecemeal steps uh, rather than trying to take the whole thing at yes. once. Which is interestingly, how China moved away from their communist thing to something different. So anyway, go ahead and follow up and figure out how to move piecemeal. Well, one of the things that you had said that you had suggested that we talk about is some specific examples yeah. of industries that are stagnating. So some industries stagnate because there's been innovation. So video rental stores used to be a pretty big thing. They're mostly gone. It wasn't really their fault. Something better happened. Um, housing is stagnating. California is at least 4 million housing units short. New York is at least a million housing units short. Housing is stagnating partly because of high interest rates, which makes sense, but also because of bizarre levels of regulation where it's become illegal to build affordable housing. So I, I think housing is one of the archetypes of a stagnating industry where you can just directly attribute that to this sort of all is known by us planner mentality where we're going to decide how cities are going to grow or in many people in many cases fail to grow the automobile industry has stagnated and a big part of that is the labor problems that they had starting in the 1970s where the the the, the wage and compensation contracts that were won by the uaw priced american automobiles out of the market we compensated by reducing quality and as a result, the, the Japanese and German automobiles snuck in, established a beachhead. Automobiles are really expensive to transport, paradoxically, because they don't flow. I mean, it seems like you should be able to transport cars, but they don't flow. And so that we're bringing them across enormous oceans. We should have a cost advantage. We lost it because of the, the differences in labor costs. So I guess I'm saying something like Dostoevsky, every prosperous industry is the same, but each stagnating it is, is stagnating in its own way. And so you made, one, you made one one serious mistake. It was Tolstoy. Ah. But look, that was a very I, serious I, mistake. Yes, I mean I well, there are people man. that would fight about that. Yes, but I mean look, I'm gonna see he talks about the high level. I'm gonna talk on a slightly lower level um, to illustrate the point. Uh, what you want to do in a place like New York or California is to be a champion of affordable housing program. Now, what are these programs? Well, if you get to the root of it, they're basically an elaborate system of price controls that doesn't work. What you say is you have to give some of these units at a below market rate to all sorts of people. And now you have to make up the losses on those units, which is the stuff that you can sell at a market rate. And if you basically say, oh, you need 5% affordable housing, you could probably deal with it. But these programs now are talking 15, 20, 25%. And even if you give free floating prices, uh, what happens in that market, it turns out as the price goes up, the demand goes down, and you can cover your losses in the regulated portion by the gains that you have on the other side. Uh, so what you have to do is essentially to back out of the market because the price controls on one set of units essentially uh, destroys the entire portfolio uh, that you have. And in places like San Jose and so forth, these things are really put into play. Whenever there's a judicial challenge to them, 
the courts always manage this to step aside and to say, these are profound industries which the legislature are better able to handle than we. Uh, it turns out they're wrong. The legislatures in California don't know what they're doing, but the judges in California don't know what they're doing because all of them essentially raise in progressive principle. Take rent control in New York State. It's another version of this. It's always been stupid, uh, but there used to be some outs with unions were allowed to become decontrolled that they went above a certain price. All of that was destroyed by the 2018 reform, which subjects everything to a stabilization regime in which as the value of a unit skyrockets because of scarcity, uh, the only thing that the owner is able to get from new tenants is a cost of living increase based on costs, which are always calculated too low. And so you start going to this kind of industry and you see exactly what's happening. You'll look at the automobile industry. I'm just going to add something to Michael said. Uh, it turns out it is very expensive to think, ship things across oceans. You still do it. But what happened is you go to states with right to labor law, which can outperform states that are unionized, and they create their plants there in places like Tennessee and so forth. And what happens is they do tremendously well, and the explanation is in the labor cost. Labor costs are not just wages. They're also all of the stuff associated with benefits of which health care um, is an enormous one, and all the costs needed to administer the labor contracts that you have. And so the difference between a union contract and a non-union contract is probably 60 or 70 percent when everything is put into it, plus the additional uncertainty it has. Well, now the non-labor guy, non-union guys in Tennessee, they have figured this out. They realize that they get a union. What will happen is there'll be an initial bump, and then slowly they will lose jobs to somebody else, and so they don't want to buy. But you go into a place like Detroit and Michigan and so forth with a strong play labor situation, they can extract very strong contracts. Uh, but you're going to see happening after this round what you see happen. So after the 1979 statute. On the 1979 deal, they said, we're going to get rid of these workers, but if you put them in a romper room and they basically sit there for eight hours a day, you'll pay them union wages. So labor unions in the UAW, they've lost half a million members or more because of plant closings and all the rest of this stuff. But it turns out there's always a new and glorious day. And if you get somebody like the current head of the UAW, they're out there breathing brimstone and fire. And what they will do is they will get their contracts through and all of us will lose out. Uh, you can see right away, it turns out that the prices of the models on these companies is going to have to go up and the demand for the cars are going to go down, and then the labor that's going to be needed to support it is going to go down, and shareholders will take a hit, customers will take a hit, suppliers will take a hit, but the union will be triumphant. Is that what's happening, Mike? Yes, and the, the, that, that kind of stagnation, I think we're going to see even more as it comes to the attempt to switch to EVs, electric vehicles, yeah. because the, the buying it for the subsidy is not good enough if the product wouldn't sell on its own. And so we're, we're seeing the, the automobile industry dissipate a lot of its energy and potential for investment for lower cost on a pipe dream. Now, you know, maybe we are going to move towards electric vehicles, but the, the, the regulatory attempt to do this is failing. So I'm going to go back to the question you asked about my distinction between directionalists and destinationists. And this is actually one that Richard has made himself about antitrust policy. One of the mistakes I think many people on the, I don't know, the, on my side who would call themselves libertarians, it, they make this rights-based argument, this is mine, I can have any contract that I want, and there can be no restriction on how I use it. So contracts and restraint of trade, things like that, they're just fine. Now, the left says, well, that's probably wrong, and so what we want to do is to have not just the uh, Sherman Act, but Robinson-Patman and a bunch of other acts that pile on these sort of per se illegal uh, contract provisions. The result has been that the train is moving in the wrong direction. Rather than saying it is understandable that there are going to be restrictions on the sorts of contracts, and we're going to try to use a sensible formula. Robert Bork's um, the, the value to consumers. So the, it, it, if this produces value for consumers, that's a sensible rule for antitrust. 
we're going to lose out on that because there's a lot of people that would say, well, we should have complete deregulation. That's not politically possible. So what's in, what I think is interesting, and I would attribute Lena Khan's success to the fact that the left has discovered originalism. They went back and looked at the legislative record, the debates in the Senate for the passage of the Sherman Act. And there's this dog's breakfast of other goals that the Sherman Act had in the minds of the senators who voted for it. Protection of labor, protection of competitors, none of these things are, are possible. The only thing that's sensible is a, a policy of antitrust that is targeted towards contract mm -hmm. restraint of trade, structure and restraint of trade that harms consumers. Everything else has got to be allowed. And I think it's amazing that for quite a while, the US had a relatively enlightened uh, antitrust policy. In Europe, the industrial policies are linked with competition policies. And what Europe has tried to do is to pick winners and losers. The United States for a long time avoided, for the most part, picking winners and losers and used an industrial plan that is just based on profits. Profits are a signal, if a company's making profits, that's a signal that this is a socially valuable activity. They should invest more and more firms should enter. If you're making losses, then some of the firms should get out or the, the, the amount should be produced less. That's industrial policy. We have an industrial policy. Saying that we're going to set up a bunch of, a clerisy of bureaucrats trained at a few large elite schools who are going to be able to out predict the market and use subsidies and taxes and regulations to perform better than the Profit, the system of profit and loss is a mistake. I think we need to try to move at the margin. Right now, the train is moving in the wrong direction. There's a lot of people, centrist Democrats, that are on our side. To the extent that we take a, well, we need to deregulate completely position, we're going to lose. If we say we need to limit the extent to which this um, bureaucratic omniscience is going to be imposed, we actually have a shot of confecting a coalition with a lot of centrist Democrats who are unhappy with what's happening on the left. Yes, look, um, I, I'm very cautious to call myself a libertarian today. I'm a classical liberal, i.e. a sense of balance. And the explanation runs pretty much as what Michael says. You go out there and you start talking to some of these libertarians of a hard variety of saying, well, why do you want any taxes at all? Uh, taxes are coercion, taxes are theft. And you go back to the classical liberal tradition, and what it says is there are certain kinds of key public goods that have to be supplied that markets cannot provide. If you have an optimal structure of taxation, which roughly speaking is a flat tax on income for standard public goods and specific taxes on activities that generate negative externalities or subsidies for those that do positive externalities, you're going to be fine. But the difference between a comprehensive flat tax system to cover all standardized needs is very different from saying there should be zero taxation. And so people listen to you say, oh, you're calling for zero taxation? And no eminent domain. Well, you're crazy, you libertarian. So therefore, I'm going to become a socialist. And what we're trying to do in our own very different ways is to say, what we're doing is to take the presumption that regulation is a bad until you could show it to be a good. And then we indicate all the cases where you can show it to be a good. And it's not just the formalities that we were talking about, or those are absolutely critical, but they're common pool problems with the construction of various kinds of minerals and with pollution and so forth. And what you have to do is to design a system that is optimal for dealing with them. So let me give you a system that's not. This is taking place in New York State, and there's a really very difficult discussion. There was a local rule uh, proposed by one of my NYU colleagues that you're going to tax buildings that are old because they're emitting too much by way of carbon dioxide and other gases. The taxes they propose are essentially ruinous uh, to these businesses, uh, but the cost of cure on these plants is very, very great. So the cost of correcting are higher than the taxes, so people are going to be subject to the taxes. So now thousands of people are going to be thrown out of their homes, mortgages are going to default, and everything else, because you're going to have this tax to control worldwide pollution with no idea of what its benefit is. 
So the righteous and indignation in New York City said, look, what we have to do is we have to suspend this tax. You could do that. And they said, we need to control global warming. So what we'll do is we'll tax businesses in New York, right? That's going to solve your problem. These are the places that can't get their offices to be filled. God knows whether they're admitting or not admitting the amounts of stuff. What we do is we do not understand that the kinds of restrictions that are imposed on net cost, and here's an environmental disaster that creates a housing disaster. And what's happening is it's all happening in slow motion in New York. And instead of having a coherent statement that, well, these particular harms aren't at the size that you think they are, you look at the better studies on global warming, you can't find any really strong trend uh, connection between carbon dioxide and overall temperatures. There are a lot of other things that are going on. We'll look off of this, open up the halving markets, but this is a two for one. We have stupid proposals on climate control that yield disastrous controls on housing. Everybody is hurt by that, but they won't even re-examine the question of whether you can do anything to control global warming through the emissions of carbon dioxide by an apartment house when China's opening up 200 or 300 coal plants every year inside of its own borders. So everything is wrong. And it turns out, you know, these are regulatory mistakes that are really big, and there's nothing you could do to correct them except going to the very erratic political market in New York State, which is a form of intellectual suicide. Michael, so how do how do we directionally move the right way? I mean, like, where would you start if you were, you know, a policymaker of some kind? How do, what's the solution to the extent that there can be? Otherwise, you have, do. To, you have to have push. Go ahead. The, 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 the Cicilline report in 2020 um, with the, the, the House subcommittee on antitrust um, actually specifically makes a proposal that they claim that the solution for antitrust policy is to make contract provisions and mergers reverse the presumption. So instead of having a presumption, and I'm not making this up, this is explicitly in the Cicilline report. The presumption is that mergers and acquisitions are illegal. You would have to apply to the antitrust authority in order to get permission. Whereas as it stands, the presumption is in favor of liberty. So my claim is, and this just backs up what Richard just said, if we had a presumption in favor of liberty across the board in as many places, that's a pretty simple argument to make. What we need is for the government to provide property rights, a stable currency, rule of law, a financial system that works quickly, a judicial system for adjudicating disputes where we can really quite quickly decide what is the applicable rule of law or common law. The, the, the rapidity with which you can process uh, disputes. If we had those things and a presumption in favor of liberty, that's really all I think that we need that we need to have. In the absence of a presumption of liberty, what we're going to get is an increasing sclerosis as this, this group of clerics expand. We saw this during the 1930s. It's amazing that the United States was ever, ever able to throw off this enshrouding of bureaucrats who wanted to say, obviously, we can make better decisions than the market can because we care about the public. And it, the, the, the big problem, I think, is not the ones who are cynical and don't care about the public that are out for power. I think the real problem is the ones who genuinely believe. I believe Lena Khan genuinely believes that she cares about the public. She just cannot solve the problem. So I think that in any analysis of the system has to look at things with two eyes. And those two eyes are incentives and information. We don't have the right incentives, which is the public choice objection. We don't have enough information and you, no bureaucrat possibly could have enough information. So if you recognize those two problems, having a presumption in favor of liberty when it comes to regulation, we can still have regulation, but a presumption in favor of liberty is, is the direction that I would like to move. And if if that were the sensibility of regulatory authorities, we would already be way down the road towards getting back towards a system of generic growth where now we have generic stagnation. Yeah, they basically, he's rearticulated what Aaron Director wrote in a very little article around 1958 or so. 
Uh, he's saying the laissez-faire is summarized in one sense. I'm a lawyer, right? And so I'm going to talk about the other half, which is what does it take to override the presumption that's being put forward? And it turns out if what you think is that any kind of harm to any discrete group is going to override the presumption, then the presumption of liberty is dead. So, for example, if somebody suffers a competitive loss because a new product comes in and his customers migrate away, if you have an industrial policy that losses from competitive activity should be compensable, you'll have no competitive activity. So what you have to do is to give a narrower definition of what counts as harm. And us lawyers do that, and I'll bet you've never heard of this phrase, but you believe in every word. You ever heard the phrase, Michael, or saying, of, damn the map square in Uria? Well, I have not. well, there's no reason you should have. It's a Roman expression, but they are very good lawyers. And it means there's a class of harms that don't count as legal injuries. And competitive harm is exactly that. Now, why is it that you would create such a class? They could not quite figure out. But the explanation runs as positive. If you allow competitive injuries to take place without the use of force and force, narrowly defined but appropriately defined, Essentially, what's happened is the loss of one guy is a sign of positive growth with respect to the economy at large. So if you treat those things as actionable externalities or pecuniary externalities, you guys like to talk about, what you're doing is you're subsidizing people who are getting things wrong on the overall side. But when you get to contracts and restraint of trade, at that particular point, the externalities are negative. And so you try to figure out the set of remedies that are going to do with it. When you start getting to other kinds of things, what's unfair competition, one of these terms? Well, there's a very precise definition of it, which lawyers use but no longer use. Unfair competition is a case where you denigrate your rival's product by saying it carries bad characteristics which it doesn't have. And so essentially it's fraudulent information to consumers or essentially it's puffing your own property by saying that it has attributes of benefit that it doesn't have. And controlling those two forms of unfair competition are a very far thing removed from setting up codes of competition, which is what the New Deal did. And if you go back to the litigation on that, when they kept to the older definition of unfair competition, i.e. passing off on the one hand or trade libel on the other hand, things were fine. The moment they changed to the new definition of what is unfair competition, anything that hurts anybody else, it turns out that it was wrong. So the intellectual history of this stuff is that you have to go through these kinds of definitions and all the particular justification to make sure uh, that you can't override the presumption too clearly. So Michael, I mean, look, an economist basically should spend his time worrying about the first best solution in the variety of cases. A lawyer has a different lens. We spend more of our time worrying about second tier issues for which we could get discernible results, which is designed to make good on the first tier presumptions that he puts into place. So it's not a question that I expect any disagreement. What you typically see in these cases is economists are unaware of these kinds of problems, and they think they kind of think that they will be solved correctly. But the cleverness of Alina Khan, uh, she spoke at the Federal Society. She was in my view dreadful. Uh, but what was she there? She was the goddess of free trade and competition. She basically put that mantle on, and she was going to stop all of these evil people. And it turns out she's not allowed to wear that mandate because she can say that she's in favor of free trade, when in fact that everything she wants to support is a restrictive practice. And so to put in language that Michael will immediately embrace, one of the most useful articles ever written in economics was Oliver Williamson's article uh, back in 1968 talking about the trade-offs that you have when you're dealing with merger and acquisition policy. You get greater efficiencies and greater concentrations, and you then need to figure out which of these two factors is going to be stronger or weaker. If you get down to that kind of debate where you know what's on both sides of the ledger, you can have really honest discussions and figure out which things go through and which do not. But if you're lean off on and you don't believe in any of this stuff, what you do is essentially you say, you've got a company which is very big, uh, it's always going to block somebody from entering, God knows how, and we could therefore regulate it. So uh, what it is, is we need people of vision to explain the major premise and people of caution 
to explain why you're not going to allow it to be eroded by having false rebuttals of the initial presumption. And most people don't think like that. Oh, you've been spending your line way about whether these are open presumptions, rebuttable presumptions, strictly rebuttable presumptions, all of that kind of stuff. But it's in that area where if you give the left its running, they can negate 80%, 70% of the gain you get from the initial presumption. So you have to have guardians at the gate to make these expansions not possible. The, I, I, I may be more skeptical than you, which is unusual. The, the left discovering originalism is a real problem. So the, the, it's not, there's nothing original about it. They got everything wrong. No, they, no, they, they got they are absolutely right about what senators who voted in favor of the Sherman Act oh, said oh, yeah. oh, the act was supposed to accomplish. There's and no so thing. when you say the modern theory, well, the modern theory is actually the old theory. That's what people were saying they wanted to accomplish in 1890. So just, we're talking sort of abstractly. Let me give a quick example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. There, was, there was a time, now young people wouldn't know this, but there, in a museum, you might see cassette tapes. And mm -hmm. cassette tapes had music on them, and you could walk around and listen to music using headphones on a thing called the Sony Walkman. And throughout throughout the 90s, the Sony Walkman sold like hotcakes. It was a, a giant successful product. Um, Steve Jobs took some existing technology and came up with an idea called the MP3 player. Yes. And the MP3 player was a way of transporting music that completely divorced the message from the medium. Because this, this is just digital information. Uh, cassette tapes were analog. This digital information could be stored and transported and listened. You could have a lot of music, many albums on an MP3 player, whereas a cassette tape you had to turn over. And it, you know, if you were running, it didn't skip. So it was it was fantastically better in every way. The earphones were better. Sony lost. $10 million in capital valuation very quickly and ended up losing almost $100 million and 6,000 people were laid off. I believe that under Lena Khan's interpretation of the original language of the Sherman Act, that might have been legally actionable. And that terrifies me because it is nonsense. But the, you look at this, it, it, it's just the extent of the harm that's measurable compared to this other harm that is not measurable and is diffused. So I think there actually is a problem with the reestablishment of a presumption in favor of liberty because the left has discovered and they are trotting out what they see as the original interpretation of the Sherman Act. Okay. And they're not wrong about that. They're not wrong. That is what Senator Sherman wanted. Look, I, I was confused. I thought you were talking about constitutional. I'm making whatsoever. a joke. I'm making a joke. No, but no, no, but the, the, it is. Bob Bork wrote this article in 1966, trying to make it into more of a clarion call for economic liberty than John Sherman, the senator, had wanted. And I think the scholarship says that he was clearly pushing the envelope far beyond anything else. Uh, when I was talking about originalism, I was talking about the original tradition of antitrust. The original laws, originalism. Uh, as it developed, starting with, there's no antitrust law until the fairly late period in time, because until you have large industries that sell and distribute, there's no occasion for it. And there's no occasion for an antitrust law if the Roman state's building all the aqueducts and turning out how they operate. But starting around 1600 and so forth, you see the emergence of this. You see it in patent law disputes that start to take place. And then there's the whole statute dealing with uh, uh, the limitation on economic liberties and the creation of monopolies. Then 1623 Act in England. Uh, 1711, there comes a case having to do uh, Reynolds v. Mitchell as to whether or not certain contracts in restraint of employment trade shall be actionable. And so the situation, I mean, these guys were very good, is you work for me, you want to go into competition with me, and if we just simply let you go out there in competition, you take the customer's list, you take the product design, you take the various business plan, and you could use the importation of your employer uh, to be deadly against them, and they perceive that rightly as a misappropriation of labor. And so what do you do to stop it? They said, well, we have to have restraints on the ability of somebody to enter into immediate competition with somebody else. Now, this sounds as vague as is possible, but it's not. What happened is there were the set of norms for former employees, 
which exist to this very day and have a rule-like quality that uh, we generally both support. So uh, you can stop this guy from competing with you in markets where you both compete. But if he wants to go to a new market, he can do that and you can't stop him, all right? And the second thing they said is, well, you can do this for a period of time, but you can't do it for who knows how long. You can only do it to the point that you have a year limitation after which this particular fellow is going to enter. And so when you start putting these restrictions on the kinds of products, he can make new products and so forth, uh, the, the space, the geographical market, and the time market, you have a set of rules that are quite clear. They take a reasonableness test and make it into something that's operational. And then you have one last category, is what do you do with employees who have essential trade secrets, or which if carried to another firm, can prove to harm you over a very long period of time. And you then try to develop rules if you can show that people have that kind of information. And the way in which people are then hired is what they do is to develop the rival technology. They create what is known as clean rooms. They take people who are known not to have this kind of information, put them in a completely isolated environment, and then develop a competitive product with the thing that this particular guy had. And so you look at this regime, which is now under attack, by the way, and you say, my God, this is taking a notion like unreasonableness and concretizing it to the point where it becomes operational. You don't want to pull that thing down by saying all contracts that restrict mobility of labor after somebody leaves a job are illegal. This is just crazy. Uh, and so when I'm talking about uh, the originalism, is not this antitrust statute, uh, but the tradition that developed both before and after it on how these contracts should be interpreted. And they're all classical liberal adjustment cases. They are not hard libertarian positions. Because a hard libertarian doesn't know whether he believes you can go into contract with competition with this guy instant instantaneously, or whether you believe that a contract in restraint of trade could be binding forever, right? Never work again. And the classical liberals trying to do this, this was essentially the framework that was also used in labor cases. Uh, the basic rule was that you could sign an agreement with your employer that you would not join a union, I even go in competition with him, so long as you work for him. But afterwards, if you want to do so and you quit, you are allowed to do so. And it turns out that the key point was, could you agree secretly to join a union before you quit? And the answer under the Hitchman Cole case was that you could not. It was another perfect illustration of something which I'm going to stress right now, is that labor markets and capital markets, when it comes to antitrust issues, should be governed by similar, not by different principles. And that was ruptured in the Slayton Clayton Act of 1914. You familiar with section six months? I, I've read it. Yeah, but it's a section which starts to say uh, that when you want to put together, if you get people in agriculture who want to form collectors and union workers, they're out from underneath the antitrust laws. So that what had been a uniform statute against monopoly now becomes a partisan statute in favor of some and against some of the others. And the consensus the other way was pretty solid in the judicial system, but it was the 1912 campaign, which Wilson won, which essentially led to the official breakdown. And the Clayton Act was done in 1914 because of the effort to overcome the Danbury Hatters case, which said that labor cartels and secondary boycotts are illegal, which was the correct kind of rule. So, I mean, the old antitrust law was actually a very good stuff. Yeah. And, and the problem about Bork was that he just screwed up the history. And he didn't say, well, you know, what we managed to do is to back off the original history where it was destructive. And here's what we produced. He explained to us why the system is wrong. And the left doesn't want to do that. What it wants to do is to refer to the earlier history, which has already been repudiated yeah. in a thousand different ways. And, and you don't want to let them do that. So what's your next industry, Michael? I have mine. Um, those are the ones that the finance, housing, automobile, video rental stores are all stagnating for different reasons. Um, I worry that the green energy industry is going to be the next to stagnate because we're seeing gigantic declines in capitalized value because it's not realizing its original promise to be able to uh, replace very quickly uh, Germany closing their nuclear power plants. 
and opening coal plants shows that we're, we're in clown world. So the, 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 the idea that we can direct this, if you believe that there is a problem, then you should favor a carbon tax, not subsidizing specific industries, because we're going to be terrible at predicting those. So that if, if you think there's an externality, maybe we can argue about that. But politically, if we decide there's an externality, you have to tax the externality, not subsidize the alternatives. That, that would be the general principle that I would argue for. And you're right, because what happens is you know what industry you want to tax, but you don't know which industry you want to subsidize. So to give you but sort of one very simple stuff, one of the huge problems that you have with respect to electronic vehicle is that certain rare earths are made largely today in China. And it turns out they're now putting export controls on those stuffs for nationalist purpose. There are supplies that are available in the United States. But the environmental laws are sufficiently tough that yeah. to get them out, you have to violate those laws. And the question is whether it's worth it or not. Well, here's, I think, a way to look at the trade-off. Um, if you talk about an EV and you ask the number of rare earths that it needs, uh, compared to that of a hybrid vehicle, it's a 30 to 1 ratio, roughly speaking. That is, you can get enough raw material for the hybrids and push 330 of them or get one EV. Well, anybody in his right mind would say, if we're going to do anything, let's tax the EV because it's consuming valuable resources or charge them the full price, and you want to go the other way. Well, then the question is, how do you maintain the EV part, even if you're going to do it? Well, the only way to do it, it turns out, is through fossil fuels. That is, wind and energy are not constant. They don't work very well in winter or cloudy days, whatever it is. And so if you listen to Governor Newsom, he says, everybody, please buy an electric car because we know it's safe for you. We're burning the continent down for other reasons. And oh, by the way, the moment it turns out that it's pressure, you better not use your car because we don't have enough fossil fuels in order to support that and everything else. And so if you say this thing, tax the externality, um, it's going to be way lower with EVs rather with these hybrids than it is any else. But it also turns out, this is the second principle, tax all EV, tax all externality, right? Wind and solar have serious externalities associated with them. So wind, it turns out, creates low-level nuisances uh, that essentially are very harmful to human beings in large number of circumstances. There's abundant evidence that says that these low frequencies also interfere with the very delicate apparatuses that, that whales and other animals use to know, navigate around the water. And you got to take those externalities into account as well. Uh, it turns out you put up these solar panels and things start crashing into them or whatever the world is going to happen. Take those things, their disposal and waste costs that you have to do when these things fall down, have to take that into account. But we don't have a rule of taxing externality. We have a rule of taxing externalities of industries that we disfavor and ignoring externalities of industries that we favor. You put the relative cost on the scale, and it's clear that an intermediate hybrid solution will probably dominate in the long run both ends, and we have no effort whatsoever of trying to get there uh, by trying to avoid this. Now, if you, if you get the combustion energy, you could control the externalities better because it turns out if you look at the externalities associated with fracking uh, from 20 years ago to the day, on every relevant dimension, they're down by a hundredfold, right? You need less water, less pollution, less uncertainty, less this, less that. Uh, don't treat it as though you said, well, in 27, this thing happened and we can't do it again. And it may well be that if you control those electrons, the equilibrium is going to move back to fossil fuels if you have an accurate text on the externalities of both kinds of vehicles, because hybrids are heavier, I believe, right? Uh, it turns out when you put tires on the road, they let off particulate matter, which is harmful to all sorts of things. And it may well be that it will shift back towards these things. What Michael and I, I think, are saying, when I put words in your mouth, is we get the right taxes and the right mix will be determined by market forces with better information than by somebody sitting in, uh, in, in California, Gavin Newsom. You listen to the man talk about energy, he's a village idiot. I mean, to say that he knows nothing about the subject is to praise him unduly. But the polish and the charm and the earnestness which he puts forward that are allowed to conceal the fact that he's turning that state into a disaster. You just look at the number of fires in that state. 
and ask how many of them are caused by his green policies with respect to the management of public forest land, and it's all. 90% of the problem is this guy and his policy. Uh, Georgia Pacific is a coke company, right, which I've worked with from time to time. They own a lot of lands in California. How many lands that they own actually have gone up in smoke? You know the number? Zero. Why is that? Because they manage the land. Instead of letting it manage it, you build up these dead trees, then you have the, the dry grass, and you let improper uses take place. And what you're doing is you're building burial mounds, funeral pyres, and setting them on air. That's what this man's in favor of. And you can't do it. So, I mean, look, again, Michael said it at the high level, right? I'm a kind of a, more of an instrumental implementation system design guy. Uh, but essentially, if he doesn't give me the right directions, I'm going to get the wrong system. Right, and if I give him the right song system, doesn't matter that he gets the right message. Well, so the division of labor between us, we're we're not, yeah, <laughs> and therefore more productive. I, I uh, am yes. worried. We we we, the society, mm -hmm. if we believe and this is contingent, but I'm a directionalist. Let's accept, for the sake of argument, that global warming is a large problem, and that it is at least in large measure anthropogenic, and is caused by the emission of carbon. If those things are true, and that seems to be the basis for U.S. policy, then we should want higher gasoline prices. We should want higher petroleum prices. When prices went up in 2022, the response of the Biden administration was to empty the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to try to keep prices down. Now, that just means we're not serious. What they, The main thing they want to do is to keep prices low. And they can do that partly by subsidizing petroleum in a bizarre way. At the same time, they're trying to subsidize the move towards electric vehicles and green uh -huh. energy. So the, the, if you are serious about this, and if you think that global warming is a problem, if you do not favor a carbon tax, you're not serious. And so Gavin Newsom is... It, it is an ineffective policy. It's not so much that I think he's insincere or not very smart. That may all be true. That policy has no hope of working on its own merits. Given the, the premises of that approach, they're going to fail. So it's not that they're evil. It's not that they're shallow. I don't understand the arguments on the left that are not actually trying to make a serious effort to solve the problem that they tell me is the thing we should all be worried about. And they don't do it. And in very large part, the Biden answer was even more absurd. If you figure out the amount of carbon dioxide produced for a barrel of oil produced in the United States and compare that to a barrel of oil produced in Russia or anywhere else, my guess is it's probably more than a tenfold difference. We are more advanced technologically. So what we are also saying in the Biden administration, we do not wish to cause global warming, but we will make sure that the uh, Chinese and the Indians and everybody else who are in the oil business and the Soviets will do that. Yeah, uh, we don't we, care. We don't care about global warming. We just don't want more responsibility for it, yeah. which is more responsibility for it. Giving it to the wrong people to produce this stuff. And the geopolitical ramifications of this are just frightening. Every time we don't produce oil revenue, Iran and Russia will, and they will take this money to use it to destabilize every institution that we know in the political area. And we just can't do that. And it's just crazy. But I wanted to raise one other issue, one other industry, which has been neglected, although it's beginning to come to the fore. It's called the U.S. military. Um, this is an industry which has been taken over by woke politics at every level. And if you start looking at the immediate signs of output, uh, there is turmoil in every one of the service academies because essentially what they do is they abuse their white um, entrance and they say, explain why you're privileged before we go on to a discussion. And what it has done is meant that military families for years are telling their children, do not go into the service because it is not going to be a service that's going to either respect you or promote you for your reward. Then you start looking at general enlistment levels, and they're below targeted situation for the first time ever. 
And it's not because the wages are doing this. That would have happened two years ago as well. It's because the same policies are driving out the core of the military in many cases, which were essentially a large southern contingent and a large midwestern contingent, both of which are politically conservative in terms of their orientation. But except without question, the most important principle of military governance, which is civilian control over the military system. And what we're putting into place are a bunch of hotheads and they're training out people and the competence levels at every situation are going to get worse because affirmative action concerns now dominate performance concerns. This is what happened at PG&E. They dismantled all their teams that knew how to control fire and they had this complete rabble crazy organization which promotes only on these diversity kinds of situations. Well, what has to happen is you have to root all this stuff out. Um, you can do that with a decent president, uh, but Biden basically issued an order trying to make the uh, service academies look more like the United States. And he meant, he shouldn't have meant, but he said the level of chaotic mediocrity that's taking over this country has to take over the American uh, military academy as well. And so this is something which is really extremely important in terms of what's going on. And if you have crisis in the Taiwan, Taiwan Strait, crisis in Afghanistan, crisis in Iran, crisis everywhere else that you look, and you're trying to reduce the size of the military and make it less versatile and more concerned with controlling climate change in the 2050, you're not gonna survive as a nation if you get those priorities completely warped. I have not heard anybody in the Biden administration make the slightest level of sense on this. And I'll go one step further. This is micro, but it's macro. Um, I am now suing Joe Biden as a lawyer with a bunch of clients because what he did is he took all the advisory boards, uh, which had importance by Trump, and he says, you were appointed by a previous president for a three-year term. I'm just ousting you from your position today and putting in my own people. It was flatly illegal, contrary to every practice for the service. And who do you get rid of? Oh, you get rid of eminent people who were appointed by Trump and you put in hacks. And it turns out that your advisory boards are supposed to be independent of the president as a check against excess of the sort that's now happening inside the academy. And his attitude is, I want to make sure that these independent boards that are supposed to be balanced reflect my personal values. So he basically gives an objection or an objective which is flatly illegal. Well, you can't take the pounding of these middle-level institutions that have worked for so well for so long in the United States and destroy them. Every advisory board which had Trump appointments on it was purged by Biden on the idea, I'm CEO, I can fire people who are not my employees and treat them as though they were district attorneys. And the court thus far has basically respected this. It was a Trump judge and a dreadful opinion. But when you're trying to figure out what the intermediate systems are in the United States, I'm going to make a point, and I know Michael's going to agree with me, I mean, is that the way in which we deal with the huge gap between the high state on the one hand and the ordinary individual on the other is we have intermediate bodies that have genuine moral authority and suasion, right? And they're kind of a stabilizing force. What Biden is trying to do is to get rid of that intermediate level so that at the top level, he has more freedom of action than he could if there were people inside government with legitimate roles to do it. So you fire all of those people. And it turns out that kind of political maneuver is one of the greatest perils to the safety of the United States because what you've done is undermine the institutional system of checks and balances, which is much more complicated than even I thought before I got involved in these cases, because there are multiple institutions of independent power, all of which are being taken over by the center. And the same thing is true with the PC, or whatever, the Consumer Fraud Protection Bureau, right? What they do is they have no way to, you can't control their budget. Now, I mean, I, I have to tell you, I have to go now. I think we've covered the topic. If you want Michael and I back for another show, it will not be a debate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can find something we disagree about, but I'm sure we can, but, the, uh, the, but but it, it has certainly been a pleasure, and um, I'm glad to have been asked. Yeah, no, yeah this you, was a lot of fun. Thank you for uh, for both coming on. That was I, I learned a ton from that. I got probably five pages of notes. 
uh, after that. And I think, I mean, there's a million different conversations you can have from this. So anyway, thank you very much for participating. Hopefully we'll do it again sometime and have a great rest of your day and weekend. Okay, right. take care. Always See a you. pleasure, Michael. See you, Rich. Bye. Nice to meet you, Sam. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this next debate. For more, remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter at the underscore Nix, and join our waitlist to stay up to date on platform developments. Tell us at the link below what you'd like to see next, and we'll see you next time.